So hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage and the Impact Conservation Institute, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Professor Sharda Srinivasan, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Ruhila, Director, ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker. Sharda Srinivasan is a professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies at Bangalore. She received the Padma Shri, the fourth highest civilian award from Government of India last year in archaeology. She has made pioneering contributions to the study of archaeology and history of art from the perspective of exploring engineering applications in these disciplines, that is archaeometry, archaeometallurgy, and archaeological sciences. She has a PhD from Institute of Archaeology, University College London on archaeometallurgy of South Indian bronzes, a master's from School of Oriental and African Studies, London, and B.Tech in Engineering Physics from IIT Mumbai. She's a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and World Academy of Art and Science. She's a recipient of Dr. Kalpana Chawla Young Women Scientist Award for 2011, the Indian Institute of Metal Certificate of Excellence 2007, and Materials Research Society of India Medal 2006, the Malti B. Nagar Ethnoarchaeology Award 2005 and the DST SCRC Young Scientist Fellowship. The Materials Research Society Graduate Award in 1996 and the DST Nurture Scheme and Young Scientist Award. She was co-recipient with Exeter University of a British Council funded UKE IRI Research Award. She she is a member of Royal Society, the Royal Society DST Award, as well as an ongoing UK IER2 award related to developing joint PhD programs in intangible histories, including archaeology and performance studies. She has been a Forbes Research Associate at the Department of Scientific Research and Conservation, Freer Gallery of Art, Smithsonian Institution USA in 1999, and Homi Baba Fellow at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, from 1998 to 1996 to 1990, sorry. Her landmark contributions have included archaeometric characterization of bronzes of South India using lead isotope analysis, archaeometallurgical studies on ancient mining and metallurgy in Southern India, studies on wood steel and documenting artisanal technologies such as mirror making and bronze casting at Swami Malai. She is the author of, book, of the book, India's Legendary Wood Steel and Advanced Material of the Ancient World, and author of more than 60 research papers. She is also an acclaimed performer of Bharatanatyam and has given numerous lecture demonstrations. The title of today's talk is Rare Artisanal Trajectories of Binary High in Bronze Mirrors and Vessels and Bell Casting. This talk touches upon a rare class of alloys, which are binary alloys of copper and tin alone, with a high content of tin known as high tin bronzes, which was not widely known in antiquity. The skilled use of wrought and quenched high tin beta, that is 23% tin bronzes, is seen to make some of the most earliest highly forged vessels found anywhere from sites in Tamil Nadu, such as Adichanalur and Niligiris, with surviving traditions in part of southern India, such as Kerala. A Kerala, while the alloy is also used to make musical symbols. The making of reflective mirrors of a composition of high tin delta bronze is a rare artisanal tradition which survives in Aranmula in Kerala, while the talk briefly touches on mirrors in an archaeological perspective. The lost wax casting of bronze bells has also been practiced in the Tanjavur region of Tamil Nadu which is another declining tradition. The usefulness of microstructural studies in metal characterization is also pointed out in this talk. So before I invite Professor Srinivasan, may I please request all of you to please put your microphones on mute. We will be taking up the questions today at the end of the session. And if you have more questions, please do keep adding them in the chat. I'll keep an eye on those. Thank you, Professor Srinivasan, again for today's talk. I now invite you to give the presentation. Thank you. So thank you very much, Padma. Am I audible? Yes, it's clear. So it gives me great pleasure to be back here on this 
series, uh, the third in the lectures that I'm giving for this series of Conservation Insight 2020. <clears throat> and today I'll be talking about the rare artisanal trajectories of heightened bronze uh, working primarily, carrying on from the work that I talked about earlier to do with uh, metal icons and so on. Well, um, you'll be hearing more about this, of course, during the course of the lecture, but just to point out that um, when we normally talk of bronze, it is an alloy of tin and copper. But as I was mentioning, when we were going through the making of the leaded bronzes, that there is the addition of lead to make the bronze more castable. But quite surprisingly, though I did talk about the low leaded bronzes in the context of the Chola bronzes, there is also a very remarkable tradition of making highly skilled alloys in South Indian antiquity and also elsewhere in India, but seems to have been particularly well developed and continuing in uh, the context of Southern India. Um, from megalithic sites such as the Iron Age burials of Adi Chinlur and the Bilgiri Cairns, uh, which have been loosely dated to uh, the uh, early to late first millennium BCE. And these have been made by working a bronze of 23% tin, which has a predominant presence of beta phase, which I'll be explaining. And as Padma was mentioning, these are among some of the earliest such knowns hot forged in quenched vessels. And as you can see, that vessel from Adi Chinlur, it really, really has a very, very thin uh, rim, uh, you know, and it's been forged into this kind of shape, which is uh, quite extraordinary scale, really, which even in contemporary times would be very difficult to do. And I should also mention that bronze as such is not very ductile. Brass is a much more ductile material, and uh, it, brass can be sheet hammered and all that quite easily but bronze and that too, Lotan bronze is not a very ductile material. It's good for casting and so on. And uh, well, what you're looking at here, one of them of course is an old copper working at Agni Gundala, which uh, was from my past field work where you can see this malachite traces from the copper ore working. But next to that, you're seeing what is a microstructure of a 13th century Chola bronze. And I already discussed the Chola bronzes, so I don't want to go down that topic too much, except to say that I'd like you to make a note of the microstructure because it consists of this dendritic pattern, a kind of like fern-like, leaf-like pattern, which is typically associated with cast bronzes. So cast Lotan bronze has this kind of dendritic shape and the intergranular regions in this case is where the lead goes and segregates because lead is immiscible in um, bronze. And that is also indicated by the Copperton phase diagram, which shows that less than about 15% tin bronze, the uh, tin goes into solid solution in bronze to form the alpha solid solution. But the artifact that I showed you in the last picture, that vessel, is made with a bronze of about 23% tin. Now, what would happen is that when you keep adding tin to bronze, it actually gets more brittle. So it's not a very workable alloy. But as I will mention, at this particular composition of 23%, if you look right up and come to a temperature range of about 600 to 700 degrees Celsius, then you get the formation of this beta phase, which is indicated by the Greek alphabet beta. And when this composition is reached and at this high temperature, the bronze seems to have been forged or forgeable to a very great extent. And that was how they were able to work out that vessel. And then when they rapidly cooled it in water, then the beta phase is quenched. And the quenching of the beta phase is very important because that prevents the embrittlement of the bronze and it gives it various other properties, which I will point to as we go along. Well, that is one type of alloy. And I'll also discuss the mirrors, this, uh, the mirrors of uh, delta bronze, as I call it, which have a composition approximating to about 33% tin in bronze, again, unleaded. And there you see, as you go up to about temperature of about 500 or 600 degrees, you see that Greek alphabet again, delta. So again, that delta under rather rapid cooling conditions forms even at the room temperatures. And that's what gives the silvery color reflective quality of the mirror that you saw in the first picture, which was actually almost as good as a modern mirror. And I shall take you to the steps of how 
those were made. Now, um, this image that you're looking at, the Bhutevi of the ninth century from the Victor and Albert Museum, which I had analyzed, I put that in just to point out that that image has 15% tin. So it is, the tin content doesn't exceed the alpha solid solution very sensibly. So, you know, all the parts are intact and so on. But take a look at the image next to it, which is an Ascas Thai bronze, which had about 20 to 20% tin. And this was analyzed and discussed by Chandra Reedy in her, in, in her article. Uh, this was on the Thai publication on Thai bronzes. Um, and here you see that the hand is actually broken off because the addition of so much of tin made the bronze brittle in the Ascas state. But what is remarkable about the beta bronzes is that uh, basically, although they had 23% tin, this is because of the fact that they are forged at a high temperature, which maintains the presence of this beta phase. And then they are rapidly quenched so that there is no embrittling alpha plus delta eutectite formed. And in fact, below you're looking at the microstructure of uh, what I call the rotten quenched 23% beta bronze bowl uh, from Adi Chilur. And you see that needle-like phase, which is retained. So it's a martensitic transformation, which retains this beta phase. And you also see these islands of alpha plus beta phase, which have these annealing twins. So it suggests that it's been quite extensively hot forged. And just above, this is just to point out that this is actually a tradition that carried on in the Chola period as well. So though they were making the cast leaded bronzes and you know they seem to have been aware of what to do with the heightened bronze you know, uh, phases and how to exploit them. So what you're looking at on the top is actually a platter, you know, like a, a tate or platter from the Chola period, which was in the government museum in Chennai, which I had sampled. And that's of the 10th, 11th century. And that is a rotten quenched beta bronze with about 24% tin. So you can see the two phases, the alpha plus beta phase with the, and, I'm sorry, the alpha, the, um, the alpha islands, the annealed alpha islands and the beta phase, the matrix, which is um, in the background. And that is again been quenched. And just to point out what happens if it's not quenched, which means if it is not very rapidly cooled in water, just below you're seeing the microstructure of a 19% uh, tin, I'm sorry, 23% tin bronze, which has not been um, uh, cooled rapidly. Or it's not been, uh, what we mean by quenching is when it's at that high temperature, you just put it in the water. And when that doesn't happen, then you see that you know, the network, the, uh, that bluish network that you see. So that is what causes the embrittlement, the alpha plus delta eutectoid. And that is the, uh, it's, it's the prevention of the formation of that alpha plus delta eutectoid, which is done by quenching and the retention of the martensite. So now that's all very well to say that that was happening in the um, megalithic period. But uh, what was additionally interesting was that using ethnoarchaeological studies, I was able to actually identify certain surviving traditions um, of uh, bronze working, which actually they're still forging, uh, hot working, forging and quenching these vessels made of this beta phase composition of 23% tin bronze. And that was also quite important to have identified this local tradition, because that also helped to point out that if there's been such a long standing tradition, continuing tradition, then it's also likely, and with such close parallels perhaps, then it's quite likely that this was a long-standing, continuing indigenous tradition, and we don't need to necessarily regard the uh, South Indian or Indian examples of heightened bronzes as exports from elsewhere. So that's where ethnoarchaeology is comes in handy. And just to take you through the processes of how this uh, uh, these vessels were made, so at the top, you see, of course, this, this documentation was done uh, back in the 90s now, and many um, of the communities have given up all of this because it's quite laborious and so on. But this is a community of the traditional Kamala who are basically a community of braziers or bronze smiths. And as you can see, uh, he is heating um, a vessel on the flame, which is uh, you know, heated to about the 600 to 650 degrees centigrade. And that's what we call annealing, heating in, the, in, a, in a flame for a long time. And in fact, uh, the gentleman just below the hearth is actually using uh, the bag bellows, buffalo bag bellows to power the furnace. 
the traditionally they were not using electric blowers and so on but uh, traditional hand bellows and then uh, as soon as they take it out of the flame they uh, there are these cycles of rot hammering tap 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 and in fact they have packed several lingots together here to to hammer them all together and then again it's annealed in the flame so that it goes up to that temperature of formation of uh, beta phase of 600 uh, 650 degrees again it's annealed and this goes on and on and on in several cycles and then finally after the last cycling a cycle of annealing it is quenched and it is the quenching as i said which retains that martensitic beta phase properties now why were they also aiming for that of course i was mentioning about how the alloy becomes more ductile so that is one aspect of it but also it seems that when you scrape and polish this beta phase you get this remarkable golden color of it it's very brilliant golden and so perhaps it was used um, in place of gold in a way and just below you're seeing how this artisan is actually um uh, working this um vessel in this very intricate sort of way um oh sorry i'm going back for am i yeah that's right yeah so um and this tradition of making vessels of this kind is also found at other uh, sites which are associated with the iron age or the megalithic and uh, from the nilgiris the cairns of the nilgiris some of the british who were there um, such as breeks uh, collected several of these vessels from the cairns and some part of that collection is in the government museum chennai and some of it is in the british museum and uh, there is his book uh, as well of 1873 which is documented a lot of these and uh, quite a few of these are actually these heightened beta bronzes um and again extremely finely forged uh, wrought to a very very fine thinness as you can see from that microstructure with very long uh, elongated needles of beta phase and the alpha plus beta islands and so on with the annealing twins and this ability to forge this uh, beta phase um, alloy 23% in bronze is also because of the formation of an intermetallic compound which actually is is very plastic it's highly plastic at high temperatures in fact it's what is called quasi superplastic that was a study that was done with uh, late oleg sherby and so that's why it could take this extraordinary um, a degree of forging and just to point out at the bottom that brilliant vessel that you're seeing with the golden color inside and the skin outside darker skin outside so that is made more recently in one of those uh, workshops that i was pointing to by the kamalar and so at the bottom of it you can see this ingot of about 15 cm and then it's been forged through these cycles of uh, you know hot forging and annealing into this very big vessel and just next to it you can see a microstructure and why that's interesting is because in a way the structure of this vessel that was made you know in the iron age so many centuries ago is so very similar to this to this vessel which is made more recently where you're seeing this retention of the needle like martensitic beta phase and some of the alpha plus beta uh, you know the uh, the alpha islands with the annealing twins and so on and so it shows that even in contemporary times they were making these vessels by a similar process both similar in composition and the technique and another interesting which thing which i had observed and unfortunately now they've stopped doing the slave turning of the as i've said by and large the craft has declined quite a bit but uh, when i had visited in parangadi in kerala there was also this use of handmade lathes and so this vessel was kept on it and then certain intricate rings were made in the center and so on concentric rings and that's also quite interesting because in these uh, nilgiri vessels and hyten bronze vessels you quite often see these decorations of concentric rings and so on and evidence of using a lathe as uh, a lathe polishing and things like that which seems to have been also carried over for over several centuries and uh, of course this example with some of the floral motifs is in the government museum chennai and next to it you also see a hyten bronze vessel which is <clears throat> from the nilgiri cairns in the british museum which also has this uh, floral motif and of course this was a workshop that i had also visited uh, uh, with my husband uh, digvijay quite some time back so what the ethno archaeology and archaeometallurgical studies suggest is that these kinds of vessels need not have been seen as imports 
but could have been part of a long-standing regional tradition. And I'll, I'll come to that as to why one might try and think about uh, the fact that they may not have been uh, made locally, for example. Um, we also have finds of heightened bronzes from Thailand, from uh, Bandon Tepet in Thailand particularly, which are dated more to about, but there's, those are quite well dated in a way, to about the fourth century BCE or so. Though we do suspect that these, some of these South Indian vessels are actually slightly earlier um, uh, because uh, there's been more and more evidence forthcoming to that nature. But also when you see the way they are forged is actually showing that they are much more greatly forged. But there are some similarities. And uh, this sort of similarity is also run through some of the early historic material. For instance, um, in this granite bowl uh, from a stupa in Taxila of the early historic period, uh, which is now in the British Museum, it's granite, but you see the rings and this slight, uh, you know, this knob, as we call it, in the center. And you also have this Indian knobware pottery, which has rings, and then this central knob and things like that. And uh, of course, there have been some explanations or some uh, theories that it might reflect, uh, you know, the depiction of uh, the uh, Mount Meru and so on. But of course, uh, we, we don't really know exactly what the significance is. But already in the uh, Adichinlur and Nilgiri vessels, you do see this formation of the knob, you know, the central knob and the circles around it. And in the Thai example, though, the knob is not actually integral to the casting, and that is not a terribly well-made vessel, as you can see. But they were aiming at this beta phase composition. But if you see that Nilgiri vessel, um, it's really fluted, and the knob is very well formed with the rings around and so on. And also there has been some microstructural analysis done, for example, by Paul Craddock on the Greeks collection, which also shows that it is 23% quenched uh, beta bronze. And there you see this extensive beta phase again, very good formation of this martensitic beta phase. So this exploitation of the beta phase seems to have been particularly well done in some of these um, examples from these, uh, you know, which are found in the context of the South Indian Megaliths or cans, and you can see that skill in hot forging, which we still saw in some of those uh, foundries, which had survived till quite recently. And in fact, so you're seeing me holding up many of these vessels, and very many of these kinds of vessels actually used to be used till quite recently in um, southern India, and I suspect in I think in other parts of India as well. And I think it was also uh, being made quite a bit in Orissa and places like that. What, what, what I call here is this talavettu uh, and so on for storage of uh, food and things like that. And in fact, I came to it also because my grandmother was describing some of these vessels and so on. And so these, uh, so just to point out just below, you're looking at the microstructure of uh, the beta bronze vessel from Adi Chinlur. And again, I was talking about the very extensive needles. And just on the other side is a vessel from Thailand of the 14th century because it continued there too, it seems for quite a while. And I had managed to get a sample from uh, Dr. Ian Glover to analyze that. And if you look at that microstructure, however, you do see the formation of a little bit of the martensitic beta phase, but there is a lot of the retention of the as cast um, dendritic structure. So it has not been forged to that extent, but it has been uh, cast and quenched so that there is some uh, ret retention of, uh, I mean, at least the prevention of the. Uh, embrittling alpha plus D delta eutectoid has been done. So this is more lightly worked and cast and quenched. So, but it's not extensively rotten forged as we can see. Now, another example where this plasticity of beta bronze seems to have been used in a very interesting way is you're looking in the center at a coin of the Vishnukundin period uh, from the Andhra region. And uh, I had managed to uh, analyze that. And that is also found to be of uh, quenched a beta 23% tin bronze. So here what they seem to have done is they seem to have hot struck it, you know, in that temperature range of the plastic beta formation because it is uh, quite plastic. So this coin was not, the design has not been made by casting it, but it has been hot struck. And I think this is one of the very rare examples we have of the use of beta bronze in coinage. So this, there are certain distinctive aspects to this tradition which had uh, survived for many years. Now, another interesting aspect was that so many of those vessels actually were found in the Nilgiris. And in fact, my husband is also, uh, you know, from the Nilgiris and knows the region well. So we had just gone around 
trying to explore some of the, uh, you know, the indigenous, um, the Toda Muns and the Toda uh, communities and so on. And we're here with uh, one of the Toda priests in, in the Tarnat Man. And actually, it's quite interesting that, uh, of course, the Toda speak a very distinctive language, which, uh, it, you know, which is not followed by many people. And it's quite interesting, though, that in their collections, um, and of course, they live in these more remote uh, places, and you can see there one of the dairy temples, and it has this, they often live amidst these megalithic cairns and circles and things like that. But uh, they do have, quite often have these, vessels, which I looked at them and I realized that those are actually height and bronze vessels. So there has been a long tradition of them keeping and collecting these, you know, for ritual use and they must have had some uh, ritual significance. Uh, and so that's partly, and they also have had quite a long-standing burial tradition. So that's probably why many of these were kept and collected there. And as I was pointing out, it seems in, uh, you know, in, in, in antiquity, this tradition was spread over Tamil Nadu and Kerala and so on. So it could have come from any of these areas um, up, up here. And since we are actually uh, also concerned about conservation and so on in this uh, lecture series, I thought I would just try and uh, talk a little bit about the corrosion products and uh, you know uh, significance in terms of uh, looking at uh, how to identify corrosion products uh, through a microscope and so on though I didn't have much time to look at this aspect in, in the series. But anyway, there, there were some uh, examples that I can point to with respect to these particular uh, set of bronzes that I was looking at. So this is a, um, uh, in fact, all of these microstructures relate to a heightened bronze vessel from Adichan Lu that I was talking about. So the one on the top that you see, which is somewhat in low magnification, there you can see this two-phase structure that I was talking about, the small islands of uh, alpha phase, which have the annealing twins, which come from the hammering and so on. And then in, in the background, you see this matrix, which just looks like a uniform matrix when you look at it under lower resolution. But when you look at it in high resolution, that's when you see the beta phase, the needle-like beta phase. So you have to uh, really look at it at a higher magnification to and it has to be etched appropriately to bring out that um, needle-like face. But when we look at that dark patch, dark patches running in there, so that's not just void, but actually that dark patch is also related to something. And you see there are still some islands of the alpha solid solution phase within that. So when you look at that, uh, those dark areas, you know, in under polarized light and so on at higher magnification, then you can see that what has happened is that the beta phase has been preferentially attacked. So there is some preferential corrosion here, maybe because the beta phase is what we call a metastable phase. And that's why, because it's metastable, unless you quench it at high temperatures, you know, it doesn't form at uh, room temperatures. And being metastable, then it tends to maybe get attacked more easily. So the entire that beta needle-like beta matrix has been um, eaten out in, in this, um, uh, you know, in those corroded areas, or rather it has been, um, it has uh, transformed into a tin oxide. That's what you see, this opaque gray material, which you see is all tin oxide. So it's all formed uh, tin oxide compounds. And that's the kind of corrosion that, that has uh, uh, happened in this case. And uh, just to give an uh, idea of also what has been happening as far as the, um, those alpha islands are concerned, when you look at that in, in higher temperature, in, in higher magnification, so you see that the alpha islands, that's not been corroded out, but around it, you see this coppery color because actually what has happened is that is what we call redeposited copper. So the copper, uh, 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 it's a corrosion product, this redeposited copper. And to some extent, that is also that is also an indication of the antiquity of objects. For instance, if you would look at more recent objects, you would not uh, probably find this kind of formation of redeposited copper. So that happens only over a long period of time. So anyway, there is a lot to be studied, of course, in terms of uh, understanding the corrosion and then looking at you know, how to consolidate and so on. So it's a vast topic over there. But uh, I will uh, then move on a bit to, uh, yes, oh, well, I still have some more things to say about this, uh, the beta bronzes. Well, another interesting aspect is, you know, the Martin Cittig beta phase, 
uh, is also responsible for giving certain resonance properties to the bronze. So when you strike it, 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 it gives off these tonalities and so on, a very high pitched tonalities. And uh, typically, quite often, the symbols, again, now this has also changed. Many have stopped making heightened bronze symbols, and they're making other kinds of symbols of brass and so on. But traditionally, also, there was a tradition of making musical symbols from this quenched beta bronze. And as I was showing you the structure, I mean, I'm sorry, I was showing you this bronze, uh, uh, was it, uh, yes, a couple of days ago, this uh, image of Nataraja, from Mela Perumbalam of the 12th century. Uh, and you'll see at the bottom, there is a depiction of the Ganas or the dwarfs who are playing musical instruments. And one of them is playing the musical hand symbols. And if you've gone to a Bharatanatyam performance, you would have heard that high pitched sound that comes with the, what we call the Natavangam. And that's basically what is being made there, the musical symbols for the, which accompany the dance. So this is already a 12th century depiction of what seem to be these kind of symbols. And just up there, you're seeing some of the analyses that were done. And just to point out that you can see that there is absolutely no lead in those bronzes. In fact, there is just the tin. Uh, these are from the Nilgiris and Ardichnur and also some of the continuing ones that I was mentioning from the Chola period. And uh, note here, the composition is all between this 22 to 23%, 24%. They were all aiming for this uh, beta phase compound, which has a composition of 23.9% in actually, it's an intermetallic compound. And there's no iron, traces of iron or nickel or arsenic, uh, silver. And so they were really aiming for this kind of composition. Um, and so that's uh, just to, to ascertain uh, that so that you would um, see what I was saying. Now, of course, we do come to this interesting question as to then what was the source of tin? Because I mean, when it comes to Southeast Asia, we know that that was a very tin rich region. Um, and uh, even in, um, you know, there, there is a lot of alluvial tin or placid tin as we call it. But uh, what about the case of India? India does not have that much of tin. It is uh, generally tin poor. But still, one thing that you must have noted when I showed you in the very first talk, how those, uh, you know, the children from the Kurumba community were panning even really, really, really tiny, you know, uh, uh, sort of micrograms of gold they were able to uh, get out from panning. So the point is that in early antiquity, even if a, a mine was uneconomical, they, ha they had the, hand the skills of hand labor or, you know, the kind of labor intensive approaches by which they could extract very, very minor amounts. So even if we would dismiss it to be an uneconomical de deposit, you know, in today's times, because you're using modern machining and all those days with the labor intensive techniques, they could well have mined out, uh, you know, mines, which today we would not deem it, uh, it would not be, uh, you know, um, probably studied or under the radar in that sense. So, um, uh, so what was quite interesting was that I did find some slags, which are from the Kalyadi region of Karnataka, and you're looking at some of the slags and the two years and so on. And uh, when I looked at the microstructure of the slag, this is just to show you that this is, um, of course, you're seeing the same glassy firelight structures and so on, which I was pointing out in the earlier copper slag. But the metal here, the prills here were not uh, copper prills, but they are bronze prills with 7% tin, which is a little, uh, which was a bit of a surprise. And the other thing is that the slags themselves have a lot of metallic iron in them, uh, you know. And so this metallic iron, would probably form in a copper slag if it had been uh, if it had been at very high reducing conditions. And here that it's formed in a bronze slag leads one to assume, and this was a paper that had also published in the VAR series, this leads one to assume that they were actually co-smelting some copper ores and tin ores together. So perhaps there were some you know, copper tin ores which were available and this had been uh, utilized in this way, co-smelted to get uh, the 7% in bronze. But anyway, so this is just to point out the kinds of studies. And I, I should also say I'm grateful to some of the support that I had from uh, the many units of Hathi gold mines and that some of the research that I've done in that early period and also colleagues then such as uh, Prabhaka Sangurmat and so on who had at that time taken me to Hathi and various other sites. Now, the other question that comes is that... Uh, this tradition of using uh, bronze without lead and so on. Uh, you know, 
of course, we know that the leaded bronze tradition was also there, but there also seems to have been quite a long-standing tradition of using unleaded bronze, as I call it. Now, this is, um, I'm taking you now back in time to Dholavira, which I had touched upon earlier, of course. And uh, so I was given a fragment of uh, copper alloy by the ASI and Dr. Bish and so on at that time, which was from the southern region, uh, southern reservoir area to, to analyze. And that is actually unleaded bronze, but it's low tin bronze. It's not a high tin bronze. Uh, it's a low tin bronze of about uh, you know five percent uh, tin, and it has those equiax grains that you would expect in a solid solution. Now I should also say that it's a bit confusing because sometimes when bronze is cold worked, it has this these kinds of what we call the you know those lines which form. They're all from cold working, yeah, the cold working lines, and you could get confused and think that is high tin bronze, and that's why it's very important to to really thoroughly know, uh, you know, the difference. And some scholars do get into this kind of confusion. So this is a uh, lotion bronze, in there, but there's no lead in it. So the point is that there pr probably was quite a long-standing tradition of using unleaded bronze. And there is one sample that Mackay reports, which, which is actually 22.1% tin bronze. And though it's the composition of binary tin bronze, I would say that we can't rush to the to the conclusion that this is a beta bronze, because unless you look at the microstructure, unless you identify that needle-like beta phase, you cannot conclude that this is a heightened bronze, a heightened beta bronze. It could just be accidental. They were just keeping on adding tin and they came at that, yeah? But we could say that quite a few of the early uh, bronzes that I'm seeing also, uh, you know, from the Harappan context and so on, they don't have a lot of lead added in them. So maybe they were over a period of time gotten used to working unleaded bronzes and eventually by the time we come to the megalithic period they may have well been able to forge those uh, you know uh, uh, you know higher tin bronzes and, and and arrive at that heightened bronze composition and so on now the other day i had talked about the um, fading art of uh, temple bell casting and of course you've already seen uh, most of the steps so i don't need to take you through that but just to point out that up there, you're looking at a bell, which is from the Darasuram temple. But I have to say, unfortunately, the original temple bell, which was of the Chola period, the late Chola period, 12th century, I'm told that, that uh, there was some damage and it has been removed. So this is not the original bell. Uh, this was a bell that was later made in Nachar Koil and put there. But anyway, at least, you know, there is a surviving tradition. And I had taken you through, through the stages where first the mold uh, is made on an axle and then the wax model is applied on top of it and then it's encased in layers of clay to form the mold and then the metal is poured in to get the shape of this bell and at the top there what you're looking at is the microstructure of this nachar koil temple bell so now you can you, you can see that that's quite different from what you've seen in those beta bronzes you're seeing that dendritic alpha phase over here and you're also seeing a lot of the alpha plus delta eutectoid, which would not have formed had it been quenched and so on. And you're seeing a lot of the lead also, lead, uh, you know, which is globular lead and so on. So this is a leaded higher tin bronze. This has about probably about 18% tin and about uh, 5 to 6% or 7% lead. So um, th this, the, the leaded, uh, the bells had a different composition. And so we have to really kind of, but this is a modern one. So we have to really try and understand what was going on with the uh, the traditional bells and such like. Probably this has, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, this has actually a bit more of tin, probably closer to 20, but it's not quenched and that's why you see all that silvery white face. So now I come to the making of the mirrors and here uh, what was happening is actually this phase which was only forming in the grain boundaries in the, uh, in the um, first piece that I showed you, that network, so for the making of these specular mirrors, what was done was that they were actually aiming for this delta phase composition because this delta phase, though it is very embrittling, it also gives certain properties, uh, you know, because it is a very um, specular material. So it gives a very good mirror finish and so on. So if you, I've brought you back to this phase diagram, the copper tin system. So if you look at around what happens around 33 or so percent tin, at, uh, if you were to, I mean, one thing you have to realize is that many of these phase diagrams were made for equilibrium conditions, which is, I mean, only laboratory conditions. But when you, this is one of those which has been attempted under usual or normal casting conditions. 
And there you see that the delta phase actually gets retained pretty much at room temperature. And that's what's happening in these mirrors. So this phase that you're looking at really consists, that silvery white phase is all the delta phase. And there is a little bit of the bluish white, uh, you know, alpha plus delta eutectoid. And this particular alloy has a very high hardness, about 500 VPN or so. And because it's hard and because it's silvery, it takes a very good polish and it forms a good mirror. I mean, you could say, I mean, why, why don't you use silver? But silver is very soft. And so it, it, it you know, it could just distort. And uh, besides, um, you know, it, it, it also tarnishes over time. Um, and what you'd see in, in modern uh, the times is the mercury coated mirror, which is basically you have a mercury backing and then you have a thin layer of glass, but there is a little bit of refraction through glass. And these mirrors, of course, there's no refraction, so it's really a point image. So in fact, the, 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 and the, it's completely reflective across the spectrum. So it's really a very brilliant kind of uh, mirror finish. But it's interesting, I should tell you that that photograph, which was, um, which was taken of me looking at the mirror some years ago, the whitish you know, things that you're seeing, I also took that deliberately at that angle because those are actually the large crystals of the delta phase, because the delta phase forms these large crystals. So you can almost see the, the shape of some of those crystals as well. Okay, so now I'll take you through some of the steps of actually making uh, these mirrors. And uh, you're looking on top um, uh, at a photograph of the late Janardhan Achari, who was one of the master craftspeople. And this tradition of making metal mirrors still survives in Aranmula and Kerala, where they made these mirrors of 33% in bronze, basically by casting this delta bronze alloy to optimize this reflective phase. But also they were able to overcome some of the problems of the brittleness because this alloy is actually very brittle. Um, you know, so uh, the, the basic, the whole aim of the way they were casting and making it and all that was to optimize the specular property, but minimize the brittleness. And one thing though I must mention is that, you know, whereas if you look at, you know, the Chinese also made a lot of mirrors and they're famous for making mirrors, uh, you know, from very early on. But often the Chinese mirrors, they added lead to make it more castable. But here, the whole process seems to have been, they were very determined to really go for that, uh, you know, the, the, that delta phase and not add lead. Because in a way, lead is opaque. So it would actually reduce the, the reflectiveness of uh, the mirror. So uh, whereas this delta phase is actually very much more reflective. So basically what they were doing is uh, they were using what I would describe as a closed crucible come mold process for casting, which is quite a mouthful, but I'll just explain that. So basically, uh, you know, you would create a, um, a, a crucible which can function both as a crucible and a mold because in that cup, which you see pointing downwards, that's where the metal to be cast has been packed. And on the top of it, there's a set of uh, two piece molds with a gap within which the metal, within which the mirror blank would be cast. And so it's heated face down in this heart and then tipped over, turned over the other side so that then the metal flows into that gap, yeah? And I'll, I'll also show you how that's done. So here you see Janardhan Achari who's uh, firing the mold in this heart, which has been covered with coconut husks and things like that. And in this case, uh, you know, this is after, and why I call it a crucible come mold is because it's a closed crucible so that there are no oxidation losses. What you saw when I was pointing to Swami Malay was the, the mold faces up and the metal is poured in. But here it's a closed crucible so that inherently there's no oxidation losses and it, when, it's, when it's tipped over, it just flows in so that it, it, it doesn't have any chance of getting impurities due to oxidation and such like. Yeah, so to explain what the cross-section of that uh, closed close crucible come mold looks like. So you see here, there are these two discs and this gap between these discs and the cup on the top. So that is where the alloy to be cast is kept. And of course, this is just a section to show you that. And down below, you're just looking at the sketches. And on the side, because another of the techniques which is useful for looking at artifacts is X-ray uh, radiography. So that's a radiograph of the, uh, of the crucible. So you can see in the, you know, the outline is the disc molds that I was talking about, and the top is a cup. And after the metal has been put there for casting, the whole thing is sealed. And then it is tipped over and uh, so on. And once it is broken, then you can see down below uh, what the, this beautiful, this shiny metal looks like. That's what the metal looks like when it is taken out of the, uh, uh, of the casting. And then it is 
embedded in resin and put on this wooden polishing board. And that stage is also quite important because when it's embedded like that in resin and kept, you know, in this wooden polishing board, then the, uh, the brittleness is minimized and then it can be polished to get that very brilliant um, you know, polish. So you can see it's a very silvery alloy which is put over there. And then we have the phases of polishing the mirror. So you can see there what it looks like after it's been polished. So basically the polishing process is of lapping, going back and forth, back and forth on this polishing board. But another very interesting step which the craftsman revealed to me is that they actually used a crushed and powdered alloy, which also comprises a, uh, I mean, the polishing powder itself comprises of powdered alloy of the mirror itself. So you see that, and as you can see, that's why it looks very silvery there. So what that, uh, the role that plays is that there's a certain self-polishing that goes in. So if there are flaws, then the, the then you know, the, the same alloy goes in and fills in those flaws. So that's why you get such a brilliant uh, finish really. And there's several uh, days of lapping it and so on, and then it's finished. And it's also interesting that if you look at some of the sculptural representations, for example, this is a very uh, famous and beautiful sculpture of uh, Madanika from Belur. And you see that she's holding up this, uh, um, you know, a mirror like this in her hand. And it's interesting that that really looks like as if that polishing board once, you know, that polishing had been done the wooden board with the mirror that itself could have been used, you know, for the, and in Bharatanatyam you have this very particular way of depicting the mirror and the aharyam and so on. Um, uh, and so that itself could have been used as a polishing board. So that's a very nice depiction there. And of course, um, many years ago, Janathan Acharya passed away, but his family are still continuing the mirror making legacy. And as you can see in the figure down there, which in which uh, this was some years ago with my husband, Dick Vijay and daughter, Lasya, and their family, you can see the daughter of Janardhan Achari, Sudhamal, and her son, Niranjan and Govardhan, they're quite active and they have taken on this mirror making tradition. And you're seeing them there with that very large mirror, which was made by uh, Janardhan Achari uh, so many years ago. And uh, so, Another aspect in terms of the analysis, which is quite interesting was, what you're looking up, up there is actually an old bronze mirror. And that old mirror actually has the insignia of the Travancore royal family. And it also has this Ganda Berundam type motif, which is you know, seen in several royal contexts, such as Mysore and so on. It seems to be probably dated about well, the 18th century. And uh, what was interesting is that, um, when you look at that microstructure, I mean, I was just stunned to see what I, what I saw. It is almost pure, pure delta phase. If you look down there, it's just that white uh, compound with very, very little alpha plus delta you take to the network. So how they managed to do that, achieve, you know, almost pure delta phase is amazing. When you look at the modern mirror, which was made more recently in Aranmula, you're still seeing some of the eutectoid network. So, you know, that didn't quite achieve what this particular mirror seems to have achieved, you know, which is just gone for the delta phase. And it's, you know, it's just difficult even to simulate it in laboratory conditions. So it shows how using these, uh, you know, maybe low cost and uh, very reusable materials, you know, there's nothing terribly high tech at one level, but a lot of skill, yes. And they were still able to make, uh, you know, uh, very remarkable artifacts. And another interesting aspect, of course, is that I talked about the Nilgiri cairns and the vessels which are found there. And there are also one or two reports of um, analysis made even in the time of Greeks. And he reports um, uh, a mirror with 30% tin from the Nilgiri cairns. I don't know which particular object that referred to because that collection is, of course, now in the British Museum and, uh, and so on. But anyway, this is a photograph of a mirror found from the Nilgiri Cairns, which is in the British Museum. I'm not sure if his analysis referred to this or some fragment or whatever. But what is interesting is that uh, at least there is some sort of, uh, uh, you know, longer standing tradition of using bronzes of around 30% in, in, the, in, the, you know, in, in, in the past. Though, of course, the Arunula mirror is more typically what I call the delta phase, which which falls between 32 to 33 percent in bronze uh, mirror. So, uh, but still, there is some some elements of continuity and so on. Um, yes, and I think this is my last slide because I was just pointing out to the fact that there are so many of these 
uh, you know, tradition by mar marginalized craftspeople and so on. And uh, this is the bastar. Uh, well, I wouldn't say it's bronze because mainly they probably use brass and so on. But this is a completely different tradition where it's made by using strings of wax. And you can see there this bastar artisan is actually squeezing out the wax uh, to make these strings to build up the models and so on. So there were these variations to the lost wax uh, casting process and so on, uh, which make it all quite enriching. And actually the Aranmula mirror makers, they were also affected by uh, the floods because they live near the riversides and so on. So there are all of these, um, you know, challenges also in terms of climate issues and the artisanal communities, which also need to be addressed better. And then before I uh, close on this theme, I was also going to show because, uh, you know, talking about it is one thing, but, uh, you know, seeing the workshop also gives certain ideas. So it's going to run you through the working or uh, the, the stages of making of the Aranmula mirror, which, which took place in the crafts uh, workshop of Gopu Kumar, who's another of the leading master crafts people from Aranmula. which is in Kerala, um, a little village where traditional metal mirrors have been made for at least the past 200 years as far as we know. And these are made of a higher tin content bronze, bronze with about 33% tin, which I studied and analyzed. This is what I call a delta bronze alloy, which has 33% tin in bronze. And this I found out by microstructural and uh, uh, SEM analysis. And this alloy is chosen because, as you can see, it's a very silvery white color. And although it's a very brittle metal, they cast it in a very special way so that a very thin blank is cast of a homogeneous alloy so that it won't break more easily. As you can see, actually, it is very brittle. I can just break it with a hammer. Or if I just do, I think it breaks. It's a very brittle alloy. These are two disc molds and then they apply, these disc molds are rough clay disc molds, then they apply a very fine clay layer made of ground pottery on it so that it gives a finer finish and then finally he applies a layer of charcoal so that you get the finest surface possible against which the mirror blank is cast. Then these two disc molds will be placed together and tiny pieces of spacers are kept to maintain the hollow between the disc molds. And then it is encased in clay so that it forms an encasement like this with clay. And then this encased clay mold is, then they, they make a little channel, a wax channel. And then this is the mouth here. This forms both a crucible and a mold. The top part is the crucible top, and this is the mold. So then they will put the metal to be cast here with a channel connecting it and cover it. And then they will heat it in the reverse process so that the metal gets molten. They will tip it over so that it forms the black. This is the first layer of ground pottery, which is applied as a slip onto this uh, disc mold for making the mirror, which he's just done by a simple polishing process on this stone anvil. First, he had used pottery over there. The final layer of pottery was there. And that is finished, this pottery. And now this is charcoal. So you see, it's a very fine slip which is applied on the surface of the mold. He puts these small metal spacers at the three corners. And then he covers it with the other mold. That will define the thickness of the blank. Then he will cover it with this clay which is taken from the paddy field. This 
fine grade of clay was made by crushing pottery. And these mirrors were used as the um, Ashtamangalyam set in, in the Kerala Nair families especially, where the brides would receive a metal mirror as part of the um, wedding trousseau. So you see here, it's all, the entire process in the, is in the hands of the skills of the craftsmen. It's a handmade technique. Then he makes the hole in the cup. And then he very skillfully widens it out so that the mouth of the crucible cup is formed. And here our cup is widening out. And here you see how he's putting this pottery. And he's showing us how he's putting this, this layer of pottery on it. So this makes some fine ground pottery. He is applying. Uh, as you saw these two processes, that this mold being made here with a clip. And then putting in, putting the mold here inside. And he's also making a hole here for the gases to escape inside that because that hole is very crucial for the gases to escape because otherwise the trapped gases will spoil the casting if you form bubbles. Slowly tipped it over. Thank 
what is happening is Mr. Gopan is going to fix this mirror. And now we get to see how we get this final mirror effect and polish. He's going to polish this on this jute cloth, which has got some uh, adhesive, uh, but it's got some polishing uh, material. Yeah. Uh, jute cloth and oil, he says that's all it is that he's using for polishing. And uh, uh, puts the oil on the wooden polishing board, and then on the jute cloth, he presses it. Um, actually, what you're watching is a modern sort of process of polishing where they're using sandpaper uh, and polishing. But actually, in the olden days, they would not have used these polishing cloths, they were using the jute cloth in Hessian. This is a modern innovation where they started to use uh, sandpaper. He's going to weld the back piece, this brass plate, and the back of the you form the Kanadi mirror. There are some of these iron bands which are put to hold it in place. The brass plate. He's put some borax powder. Now he's going to do like a welding job. This is how the mirror is fitted into the final what they finished. Now they are drying out. They have, we can't touch this because it's hot. Basically, this is the handle for the mirror. It was heated here. This mix of, uh, there was a layer of resin with mixed with soil which was put in the bag. And then the blind was put on top of it and it was heated so that it is set. And now it's being left to cool. And polish it with cotton, smooth cloths. In this direction, up and down. Finally, this is what the Aranmula Kanadi looks like in its finished state. Here it's been put into a large brass handle, and you see a perfect point in it due to this polishing of the specular bronze alloy. And you see the splendid reflection of the greenery of the trees and the leaves inside this mirror. It's no wonder then that it's almost called something like a magic mirror. And I think it's wonderful that a fairly high-tech product has been made using a very low-tech method, almost organic and recyclable materials, the organic materials of dung, pottery, everyday materials, burnt refractory materials, nothing very uh, sophisticated, and everything is recycled, so it's a very eco-friendly technology in a way. We hope that this craft survives the vicissitudes of change. Thank you. It was indeed a very nice lecture, very informative. So, um, can we take the questions? Uh, even the last ones? Yeah, sure. I'll just quickly go through the questions that we'd received last time. Yeah. Um, there was one about uh, lead isotope study comparing uh, those from India with those from Southeast Asia. Yeah, well, um, there's been some, um, uh, I think it's still ongoing. It's not quite, uh, I mean, we all gave some samples. There is a uh,
I think we can't hear you. I think the video and uh, mu uh, microphone is off. Hello? Yeah, we can't see the video also. Sorry. Um, Professor Shinivasan, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure why, but uh, somehow it says the host has stopped my video. Uh, can you just check? The host has asked you to start the video. Okay, now it yeah, says. I it's just I <laughs> Okay, thank you. But again, it's saying you cannot. Uh, okay, is that all right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay. For my side, everything is on. Sorry. So. Well, uh, one thing that hasn't really happened is that probably there needs to be a um, comparison of lead isotope uh, analysis of maybe uh, Indian bronzes and Southeast Asian because we're always talking about the comparisons in terms of influences and so on. So that would be useful. But I don't think that's been attempted yet on you know the Southeast Asian um, Buddhist icons and such like. Um, partly because it's a, it's, it's quite a, first of all, you need to be able to get the sample from the artifact. So we need to permit you to do that. And also the thermal, uh, thermal ionization mass spectroscopy needs quite a lot of precision. So the, it needs ultra high clean rooms and so on for the separation of, uh, you know, the lead, because in this case, you're talking about bronzes in which there would not be a lot of lead. So, um, in, and in fact, some of the species, specimens that I did look at were what we call higher lead, you know, so that's a little bit easier to do. But the lower the lead content, it gets even more, di more difficult to extract. So I don't think for these reasons uh, it's been attempted yet. But I mean, I know, for instance, some curators, uh, particularly in, in um, the Netherlands, where there are a lot of collections of Southeast Asian bronzes, we had talked about it, but I don't think it's quite worked out or happened yet in that same, you know, the way it deserves to be. And also, even in terms of the ore sources, I don't think there's exhaustive information yet on ore sources and so on. So it's still a research in progress to some extent. Okay, thank you. The next question was, how were people able to control melting phases and temperatures without furnaces, control instruments in those ancient days? What was the possible ways in which they would... Well, as you saw with the foundries and so on, they uh, over a period of time they do de they did develop a certain empirical understanding. It's not a theoretical understanding as in the present day where you use phase diagrams and so on, so you can very accurately map all of this. But it was more an empirical thing where they also judged a lot of things by the color of the flame, and quite often uh, that's why the processes took place you know, later in the evening and so on. So they could see the color of the flame quite uh, easily. And uh, I guess it's a lot of trial and error and practice and so on. And then once they got the perfect you know, outcome, then they would keep, they would do everything they could to, to replicate it. But you know, mind you, I remember when even for the woods technique, um, you know, we tried to do some, you know, we tried to do some iron smelting and uh, so on uh, experimental reconstructions of the woods uh, also with um, that was also something we experimented with uh, Dr. Kanoya. But it's it's not easy. It's it's actually quite all of these are quite challenging if you want to do it yourself. So they really have developed their own skills and so on. But at the same time, it is um, you know handcraft. So it's not uh, it's not something that is not doable. I mean because they did manage to do it. So it's just a lot of practice makes perfect kind of thing. So. Thank you. The next question is about any evidence of Nataraja bronzes from northern, northern parts of India or rest of the world? And the other part is, do all the Nataraja bronzes contain same percentage of contents? The yeah. Now, uh, the thing is that it, um, the Nataraja bronze in that form with the leg extended in what we call Bhujangatrasita Karana, that we don't see much uh, outside the Tamil region. Of course, in the Pala region, you do you did find uh, I think a couple of Natesha, which is the leg in the Chatura Tandava pose. Uh, the, uh, from the eastern India, it has been noted, 
And I have seen one, um, but it seems to be a late piece uh, in Thailand, which looked to be like an atrajas. So maybe there was some influence from the Tamil region, but it was a bit of a later piece. So um, I think there's still an area of study there, probably. You know, the problem also with metals, of course, I mean, and with bronzes, they are in private collections or temple collections, often not studied that, you know, not that easily available for study. And that may well also be the case, we don't know, in Southeast Asia and so on. So, yeah. Um, yes. And was there any other question on that? The, do they all have the percentage of contents, if you can, about the percentage no, not even, of contents? Not even in the Chola, this seen this not really uh, not inter alloys it very some are leaded uh, bronze uh, I mean the, the composition of tin and lead can vary um, so I won't say that they all had exactly you know the same it, it was a general leaded bronze but the the clustering in terms of the trace elements was because of the ore sources which I pointed out had some you know there was some relevance to there but not the major elements are not that finely controlled in that way Thank you. Except to say that, yeah, they follow the general alloy composition that they may have been using at particular periods you know, more, and, and maybe some, but I have to say, I don't think I came across, um, for example, um, one, one other thing which is interesting in my study is that a lot of the Natrajas, I didn't really come across, for example, too much of Nataraja from the Vijayanagara period. So, because it, they had moved to Vaishnava worship as well. So, you know, to that extent, there are these kind of differences. Yeah. Um, the question is, how is the clay core accessed for, you know, assessed for uh, petrographic analysis if it is encased completely in metal? How do you access yeah. it? How do you take samples for analysis, the clay core analysis, petrographic analysis, if it's encased completely in metal? Well, as you saw, many of those holocaust images they actually inevitably get uh, have shows some evidence of damage because it's not solid metal. It's, so the bulk of the weight of it is being borne by the core. So quite often they have some damage or the other somewhere. So the the the, the core is exposed. You know whether it's the back or this that many of those have that. So the way they've accessed it is of course wherever the damage area is and the core is exposed. You know then you can uh, have a go at it. Otherwise I don't think people would go about. Um, you know, cutting the edge to kind of access it. So a lot of it has been done because they were damaged. Thank you. Are the copper sources for the making of bronzes, have the copper sources for the making of bronzes varied over the centuries? And within this, what makes the Chola bronzes unique? I think I already talked about some of this, that there is this variation. And the Chola bronzes are mentioning a lot of them were leaded uh, bronzes and so on. I could talk mm. about that. Okay. The next question is, uh, how do they get uh, the metal for pouring in the mold? What is the source of the metal that was poured in the mold? I think so yesterday's uh, lost wax process, um, how is the metal obtained for pouring into the mold? How yeah, that is heated in a crucible hearth and then taken, because if you notice the crucible is taken out of a hearth, it has to be melted there and then poured in. Yeah. Okay. So a few questions from today's uh, talk. Now I'll move to those. Uh, let me get there. Yeah, it's Which great. material, sorry. It says which material is recommended. Just missed the question, yeah. The first question is which material is recommended for cooking between brass and copper? Because copper bottom with utensils available in market are just an eye wash. So what is a better material for cooking between brass and bronze? Between brass and bronze? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, I have to say brass can tend to corrode because it forms verdigris quite easily. So uh, brass, because of that reason, it's a bit toxic. And, and that was one of the reasons why the heightened bronze alloy was preferred because it is the intermetallic compound. Uh, you know, it doesn't get that same kind of uh, toxic kind of products. And as you know, even in um, contemporary, I mean, quite recently also, they use tinning of artifacts. So tin is perhaps less toxic in that sense. So, 
Yeah, but there's a whole area of study to be done there, I suppose, in terms of toxicity. And copper itself, in fact, it, it, that generated a lot of interest even in these COVID times that it was yeah. found that, that the um, uh, copper is uh, um, one of the metals on which the virus uh, is there for less time, only two hours or so, as compared to maybe stainless steel or plastic and all where it actually lingers much longer. So copper has been known to have those kinds of somewhat antibiotic properties or anti, well, what do I say, anti- uh, microbial disinfectant or whatever yeah, mm -hmm. yeah something of that kind uh, yeah but uh, you know at the same time if it has lead in it that also results in toxicity so i wouldn't necessarily say that it's always a good idea to go back to you know because sometimes they did have some lead in them and that also can you know it's not exactly good mm -hmm. for your system in that sense so you have to yeah. balance it i guess yeah thank question. you the next question is how does quenching with water versus quenching with oil affect the metal microstructure? Yeah, so in this case, they were not quenching in oil, as far as we know, this quenching in, in water. But uh, we do see these reports of quenching in oil with, with steels, for instance. It's a similar kind of martensitic transformation. So uh, it's slightly, um, perhaps, it's, it's a slower kind of quench, and then you get maybe the Wiedemann Staten structure and so on. So I think there is a lot to be studied there, I think. But then the, this is where the experimental archaeology comes in. You know, mm. the experimental process where we try to match what uh, we try and kind of find out what could have been the stages in making this, getting this particular structure by first experimenting with it. So there's, there's a whole lot of work to be done there as well. Okay, thank you. The next understand some of this. So I think our understanding is still... There's two aspects. One is the ethno-archaeology and the other is the experimental um, archaeology mm -hmm. as well. They both need to go together to some extent. Okay. And likewise, I'm sure with uh, the corrosion products as well, you know, to understand how we get those. So we have a lot of work there. So yes, we, that's why the microstructures become quite important. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The next question is, does burial affect uh, the change? I mean, does burial effect, you know, result in any change in the microstructure, the phases formed during manufacture of archaeological objects in any way. When, since they are there for that long, does that affect the microstructure? Well, I mean, to the extent that burial um, could speed up the corrosion process, it depends again on the burial conditions because, <clears throat> for instance, in Egypt, the reasons why things have remained for so long is, is probably because it's a very dry climate and so on. So it's not affected much by the humidity. So many things, even paper and all sorts of things have preserved, you know, papyrus and stuff like that as well. Apart from that, uh, you know, a lot of things uh, have preserved wood, for instance, which would probably in our kind of wet climate, the wood would deteriorate quite a bit. So, so the burial conditions, obviously, yes, it does have a role to play because, um, it, it, it depends very much on the burial conditions, if it's alkaline or acidic or whatever. So in some cases it can, yes, it can accelerate the corrosion and so on. So to some extent, but one problem is that many a times when objects are found in hordes and then they are taken away to museums, we actually don't know the burial context. So it's not that easy to understand how that has played a role in the corrosion and you know, so on and then the next steps. So yes, that is a very important aspect to um, you know, to be understood, for instance, uh, um, you know, for instance, it could have a lot of the, um, the, 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 well, anyway, the damp and many of these factors are related to very yeah. The next question is, can you elaborate on copper redeposited as a result of antiquity? Because it's important to distinguish authentic from fake bronzes that could be one of the ways to do it yeah so no the, actually that deserves a whole study in itself and it's just that i was observing that these very old uh, bronzes do have this redeposited copper which you would probably not find in in the, the the more recent things so to my mind that could be a factor which you know deserves more study and so on but i think there's a lot to be understood there in terms of the, me the mechanism and, and such like and also even just maybe making this kind of archive of microstructures, you know, correlating mm -hmm. with time, then you would understand what, uh, you know, you would find. Because typically, for instance, a modern piece would not have very deep corrosion 
like some of the pieces that you saw, you can see the corrosion is eating in, you know, into the intergranular regions from the, from the surface. So if it is a recent piece or if it's just been patinated or something, you wouldn't see that kind of deep corrosion. So that's also where the microstructural, uh, you know, um, studies. Yeah. And yeah. Thank you. Coming back to the question of burials, Anjali has clarified. She says, would burial lead to change in the phases? I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. She meant, would it change the phases? For instance, could beta phase formed at the time of manufacture change into something else due to the burial? Yeah, because normally, I mean, and to, to that extent, the, uh, you know, once the phases, you know, they don't transform like that in archaeological time, so to speak. I mean, they corrode, yes, but they don't, uh, I mean, there is, you know, you, you, you could talk about, the, there is a process of recrystallization, which, uh, you know, it has been talked about whether recrystallization happens, you know, aging and recrystallization and so on. But I don't think it's been... Um, very well understood documented but normally you would not expect uh, you know the the phases themselves to um, because you see the phase transformation happens under a certain pyro uh, you know technical process because uh, the the let's say beta transforming to to alpha plus delta eutectoid it's it, it, there's a you know rapid cooling and so on so in archaeologically i mean in, in once the object is actually formed it it wouldn't um you know, though, of course, you could have, for example, you know, you could, I mean, uh, for instance, if, 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 let's say, iron was struck by lightning, let's say, maybe you could have a weedman statin uh, transformation or something like that. But it has to be a very, maybe, drastic kind of uh, thing for that to happen, perhaps. Yeah. 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 Normally, uh, would it, the phases which are there now are what were there when they were manufactured. Mm -hmm. That is the general thing. Thank you. The next question is, uh, as we saw in that the mirror making process, now the buffering is done with the polish and then instead uh, earlier it was done, hand, hand polishing was done earlier. So is there a change? Will buffering generate the same grade of finish to mirrors instead of the earlier hand polished mirrors? Is there a change in the grade of or the quality of the mirrors, with the change of the you know, methods of polishing? I think it's more just the time taken that it cuts the time down because I remember when I was there in, in the early 90s, they were not using the, the sandpaper and so on. They were using uh, the traditional polishing, uh, you know, uh, powders and things like that. And uh, th th that was, th there were still very good mirrors being made then. So this is more of a recent innovation. It's more of the fact that some of the me me mechanization process is more to speed up because it's very labor intensive otherwise. You know? Because, I mean, this alloy uh, typically, because I don't know if you'll have, any of you have made microstructures, but the way you make it is that you polish in one direction and then the other direction, some, sometimes using these grades of emery paper. So they've you know, adapted also looking at some of that, but it's mainly to save the time really. The next question is a general question. Everybody is curious about these documentaries that you have prepared, the videos that we've watched. So they are all asking, is there a platform or a source uh, where they can access these ethnographical documentary videos? I think we had three questions related to that. Uh, so is there a place, any email, any, you know, maybe a website or some place where these are uploaded and they can access it as hmm. such but, documentaries is the question. You mean these particular videos or general videos and things? So or... This thing, ma'am has an extensive research work done by her. I'm sure she has prepared a large number of such ethnographic documentaries. Is there a place where we can access or see these? More of these? Yeah, well, um, well that's a work under progress because uh, <laughs> there is a lot of the material, but uh, and trying to put it in and in fact uh, had also submitted a couple of documentaries for IGNC and EB once they're available because it does take some you know work to edit and I, you know it's we're always struggling for funds I would love to make <laughs> some mm -hmm. more but I, I, I mean I haven't actually set up a site or something like that maybe eventually because yeah. Anna's quite busy with this writing and publishing to start with but uh, certainly I'll keep it in mind and things yeah. 
but you know a lot sometimes a lot of it is just that you just go and there's a lot of this raw footage and then it has to be edited and everything yes. so some of it you know and when you get funds too you can find somebody to do it or whatever so it all takes uh, you know due course but certainly it's something to keep in mind now that uh, you know this is an important thing i think that we do because many of the techniques are just changing or you know dying out and all the rest of it so as much of it that we can document but you know for instance when i was starting out we didn't even it was so expensive to even get the video you know yeah. equipment which is one so need now in this digital era but you know in this digital era many of the things have have, have either disappeared or they're on the last legs so yeah. now so you have the technology but the traditions are no longer there i think it's it's a very yeah a unique situation so thank you so much professor shrinivasan for these three lovely lectures for your patience it's been wonderful uh, the time that you took out from your very i know such hectic schedule and uh, spending three days three evenings with us it was wonderful and those are the questions those are all the questions we had hopefully we will keep in touch and whenever there is something new or whenever you have something new to share please do let us know we would love to again meet on this platform or maybe some other platform maybe even face to face someday hopefully if situation improves and get to again interact thank you so much and all the best all the best to all your endeavors and thank you for all the questions which have all been interesting as uh, padma and i was saying you know to 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 certain extent maybe we had to kind of uh, get those which were most relevant to the talks because otherwise there will just be too many because there are so many questions in all of this but i will engage with maybe happy to engage with you all and so on in the future to to look at uh, you know the yeah further yeah so thank you so much yeah so for the great opportunity because as as some of you said you know where do we see these videos we also have the question where can we actually showcase these videos <laughs> because we don't know necessarily have places of course there are some online links and all that but you know in terms of the reach so you you've given me a great opportunity also i would say to share this thank, thank you so much pleasure was entirely ours and so thank you all the very best keep going keep going strong i think we need people like you metal and metal conservation and metal analysis is a field i think very few people venture out and um, i hope that you go do more and more research work and enlighten us more and more in future so all the best to you take care thank you, thank you. Thank you. Take care, all of you, and all the best. Yeah. Bye.